Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone joined in today on our 40th Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo Talk. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority, New Delhi, as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. The Mahotsav is a 75-week-long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, which falls on the 15th of August 2022. The Central Zoo Authority is taking the celebration forward through a massive outreach campaign entitled Conservation to Coexistence, The People Connect. Under the helm of this campaign, we will be showcasing 75 conservation priority species and 75 zoos, highlighting one species and one zoo each week. We are currently in week 40 of this celebration with the saltwater crocodile as the species in focus and the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust as the zoo in focus. So joined in today to speak to us on the species is Dr. G. V. Gopi. Dr. Gopi is the senior scientist at the Wildlife Institute of India and he heads the Department of Endangered Species Management and is also the nodal officer of the EIA cell at the Institute. He has over two decades of research, conservation and management experience on inland, coastal, coastal wetland, marine habitats and its associated species in India. He will speak to us today more on the species. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arundhati. And, uh... Before I begin, uh, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the Central Zoo Authority and the Member Secretary and Dr. Sonali Ghosh, uh, the DIG and Arundhati and uh, Gauri Malapur for you know coordinating this very very innovative and very interesting awareness uh, program so that it can reach the masses. So uh, first and foremost, I thank all of them, and I'm also privileged to share this talk with uh, Mr. Nikhil from MCBT. And uh, both of us, uh, first I will speak about uh, the species, biology and natural history. And then um, he will be speaking about uh, the zoo and its management and all those aspects. And then we will take uh, the questions, uh, uh, you know, jointly at the end of our session. As uh, since it's a very split talk and uh, uh, there are a lot of things to cover. So I'm going to uh, present this particular species biology on a very broad brushstroke since there is going to be a mixed audience, uh, biologists, non-biologists and all of those things. So, so uh, my talk is going to be specifically concerning only about the natural history and the species biology and some of the facts that one needs to know. So now let me share the uh, presentation. I hope uh, you can see the full slides. Yeah. It's visible, sir. Yes. Yeah. So now saltwater crocodile, as you see in this image, in the cover image, uh, it's uh, a nesting crocodile, a nesting female. Uh, the saltwater crocodile has a, quite a lot of, as a species, a, quite a lot of uniqueness. Um, so I would like to list some of them. Uh, some of them are, it's one of the largest of all the crocodiles that we have. And uh, this is also one of the largest of the reptiles in the world. In fact, there is a Guinness record. It is in, entered into the Guinness Book of World Records. One of the largest uh, individual of the saltwater crocodile. In fact, the largest living reptile is currently in uh, in India in a place called uh, Bitterkanika mangroves in the east coast of India. We will talk about the cro crocodiles of Bitterkanika uh, later on. And another uniqueness is also it is it is most widely distributed uh, uh, reptilian, and it is a powerful uh, uh, species. It is it has one of the maximum bite force for any animal. And then um, one other interesting and unique uh, uh, unique behavior of this particular uh, species is it is the only uh, mound nester. Okay, other crocodilians they nest uh, you know hole their they nest. Uh, they dig a hole and then they nest, but this is the only crocodilian um, in India. It, it builds a mound and then it lays its eggs. And then uh, um, in, in, in terms of habitat, it, it can it can thrive and it can also go and live in uh, freshwater habitat and also in brackish water or estuarine habitat. And also, you know, it can venture into the sea, but largely it, it prefers to stay in the uh, brackish water. So these are the, some of the uniqueness of uh, this particular species. And as I said, uh, the geographical range is, is very wide range, right from southern India, from Sri Lanka. It, it encompasses, you know, much of the coastal uh, regions of uh, uh, Bangladesh and then uh, uh, Southeast Asia, 
and then it uh, from and then goes on to philippines and then um, papua new guinea solomon islands and, and australia but uh, at the meantime this has gone extinct in many places um, many countries like for example it is uh, supposedly potentially considered to be extinct in uh, many places many countries like cambodia and uh, thailand uh, singapore vietnam and those there are some populations of introduced reintroduced populations do exist and but uh, even in the indian coast you see you know the potential distribution is there but uh, you don't get to see them all along the coast so though they have been uh, occurring though they occurred historically all along the coast but uh, now if you have to see where they are distributed in india it is distributed in very sparsely in very few localities in andaman and nicobar islands in sundarban mangroves and uh, the largest of the population is found in orissa in the bitterkanika mangroves and bitterkanika mangroves is also incidentally like for example when we talk about mangroves we you know we say that highest diversity of mangroves is found in papua new guinea the second diverse high highest high species diversity is found in uh, bitterkanika mangroves similarly uh, the crocodiles salt water crocodiles are also distributed in papua new guinea and also in uh, in the bitterkanika mangroves uh, where you know you have very high species rich uh, mangrove uh, diversity this is to do with uh, the uh, distributional range as i said it's a very large ranging uh, uh, species uh, when we look at uh, the taxonomy it is um, obviously you know we are talking about a, a reptile and uh, it is placed under the super order diapsids diapsids uh, meaning there are two diapsids there are two skull openings uh, we can call it call them as temporal fenestres anapsids like for example the turtles uh, the turtles are all anapsids they come under anapsids and uh, so the crocodiles are diapsids and if you look at the order it comes under the crocodilia order see the crocodilia order also encompasses uh, the alligators uh, the caimans and the you know uh, the uh, the gharials as well and then it comes under the family crocodilidae which uh, encompasses about 18 species of crocodiles and the genus is crocodilus the crocodile is you have another crocodile sp you know genus which is crocodile palustris in india that is the marsh crocodile or the mugger and then the species that we have is porosus what we are talking about is exclusively on the salt water crocodile and it also has uh, several names to it um, it is also called as salty it is salt water crocodile estuarine crocodile or or, it, or also it is also even called as the naked necked crocodile why is it called naked necked crocodile we'll come about that later on and then um, uh, the world conservation union has placed it under uh, the least concern category uh, because the population at one point of time was very uh, it, it was decimated and then now uh, due to the conservation efforts of uh, the our government uh, government of india the population has completely bounced back and in fact we have now good number of um, uh, good number of uh, uh, the uh, a good number of saltwater crocodiles in our country and it is placed geograph uh, globally uh, looking at the population numbers it is uh, placed under the least concern category however the indian wildlife protection act it is placed under schedule 1 schedule 1 meaning it is accorded the highest uh, protection that is available mandated by uh, the law and the cites uh, which uh, pro, you know, which uh, looks after the trade of uh, you know the convention that it looks at the trade of endangered species. Uh, these placed under the appendix one list, uh, but also it is also found in the appendix two list, wherein controlled uh, kind of uh, trade uh, do exist. Uh, some countries like Australia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, so they all are placed under the appendix two. Uh, the appendix two. Now, when we look at uh, uh, the skull of uh, the crocodilians, obviously, you know, uh, the garial uh, skull is completely different that of the crocodiles that we are talking about, um, which has a very long snout, uh, whereas uh, the mugger, the marsh crocodile, and that of uh, the saltwater crocodile, you have a in a broad snout, and then uh, uh, it's come, it's uh, very distinct that of even that of the alligator. 
And uh, one other important thing that I said in the beginning itself is it is also called as the naked neck uh, crocodile. Why is it called as the naked neck crocodile? See, the crocodilian, crocodilians have, uh, you know, uh, they have a lot of uh, scutes on their body um, on the dorsal side. Uh, so if you look at uh, there will be a lot of scutes and whom those of you who have uh, watched it very closely uh, you you observe different kinds of different types of uh, scutes and you know uh, scales and um, uh, so uh, these are the three different uh, species that we have in our country that uh, garial in the wild mugger and estuarine if you look at the uh, saltwater crocodile we that we are talking about this post occipital scutes right after the, uh, the 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 post occipital scutes are not uh, present. It is distinctively absent compared to that of uh, the other crocodilians that we have. So this is one of the distinctive identifying feature. Sometimes you know in many places you know um, the, the, you know, you might get a you know a dead uh, a dead specimen. So in some some in some places where there is a possibility of both the species existing. So there might be, you know, confusion like, you know, if, if there is, uh, you know, necessity for identification of uh, that particular individual to which species does that belong to. So one can uh, use this as a key to identify, uh, identify, identify the, identify the species. So now. So when we look at certain uh, biological facts about uh, the uh, saltwater crocodiles, uh, see this is an ectotherm, ectotherm uh, in the sense the uh, the temperature, um, the metabolic activity are all influenced by uh, the temperature from outside, and uh, um, so the metabolic rate is also very uh, lower and it has a slower uh, heart rates. Uh, and if you look at that diet, it is uh, carnivorous, it feeds on, and it's also, uh, you know, a nocturnal, mostly it's a nocturnal hunter in, in wild. And it can also scavenge on dead and uh, dead, dead, they can hunt an animal and then uh, it can um, keep it in this territorial range and then have it for uh, maybe, you know, a few days also. And um, the major prey animals include it can prey on mammals, it can prey on birds, fish, invertebrates such as you know uh, crabs. Um, and uh, uh, if you look at uh, reproduction, it is oviparous. As I said in the beginning of the talk, uh, the it's it's a egg laying. It, it lays it, you know it lays the eggs in a it builds a mound first. We'll talk about the nesting pattern and nesting ecology in in a couple of slides later on, and then. Uh, uh, approximately the clutch size will be roughly from 25 to 60 odd eggs. It takes about two to two and a half months uh, for uh, as an incubation period. And uh, as if you look at the parental care, both males and females do take part, but largely the females, uh, you know, or, uh, or the largely the females tend to stay very close to the uh, very close to the nest. That means they uh, in the uh, near the mound. And the sex is also determined by you know other uh, reptiles. The temperature uh, is the temperature governs the uh, sex determination. There are pivotal temperature before beyond which it becomes male or it becomes female. And then uh, um, there are uh, so this 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 gives a just a bra, you know a dist, uh, basically a, a distinctive uh, distinction between. All the three crocodiles. What we will focus only on is on the estuarine crocodile. As, uh, this is uh, as, as we saw the distribution. It is from India to you know uh, South, Southeast Asia, from Indonesia to Philippines to Papua New Guinea to North Australia, and it largely the habitat is of the estuarine rivers and creeks where mangroves are present. And it does seldom. It does uh, tend to um, go upstream in the rivers and also in open seas. Uh, the open sea migration has been very well documented, recorded in um, in Australia uh, because they have done uh, satellite tracking of um, satellite tracking of the saltwater crocodiles. So they do go venture into the open seas, and they they do have uh, you know uh, they do um, migrate into the uh, into the ocean, and. Uh, if you look at uh, the adult, uh, the coloration, the, the dorsal pattern is darkish gray, 
and two blackish and and the ventral portion will be very lighter lighter in color and uh, uh, the adult size adult size again uh, if you look at if we talk about um, if you look at uh, the size of an adult male it ranges from somewhere around 3.5 to 6 meter in uh, in length if you look at the females it is about 2.7 to 3.1 meters that is roughly about 10 to 11 feet but males can grow really really big and uh, it can grow up to you know 20, 20 feet or even 21 feet uh, in length and the weight also is uh, uh, it, it, um, it can attain a weight of more than about 750 to 1000 odd kilograms and uh, in, in australia the size uh, the reported size are about 4 to 4.5 meters and uh, in papua new guinea it has been reported that the, there was a crocodile in, way back in 1979 about uh, 20 feet, four inches of crocodile uh, was recorded uh, in Singapore, um, you know, in about 19 feet. Um, but in Bitterkanika, the Guinness World Book of World Records uh, mentions that in Bitterkanika, there is one individual which is about seven meter, roughly about 23 feet. You can imagine the size of this particular individual, about 23 feet um, uh, uh, crocodile. and. Uh, uh, and uh, at what length they, do they become uh, mature? Uh, they, 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 they become mature uh, by, you know, about 2.2 to 3.2 meters. And then uh, they attain sexual mature, maturity about uh, uh, the males when they are about uh, uh, 16 years of age. That is about uh, when they attain about 10 feet, uh, 10 feet, 10 feet or 11 feet, uh, you know, in length. And then uh, the females attain sexual um, maturity about uh, 12 years of age uh, when they are about 2.1 meters, roughly about uh, uh, six to uh, six and a half to uh, seven feet uh, in in length. And one other important thing uh, that uh, I would like to you know stress is, yeah. So uh, uh, th th there is a uh, sexual dimorphism in terms of size. Size sexual dimorphism is prevalent in uh, in uh, the saltwater crocodile, in the estuarine crocodile. The males are uh, the, it is a male cured uh, sexual dimorphism in the sense um, uh, the males are much uh, larger and longer compared to the female. But when you look at in the turtles, like for example the sea turtles, it is it is uh, vice versa. The females there you know are much uh, larger and bigger. Uh, compared to that of uh, the males. Males are much smaller in sea turtles. But here, uh, on crocodiles, when you talk about uh, crocodiles, the males are much, in, especially saltwater crocodiles, the males are much larger and bigger and lengthier compared to that of the, uh, uh, compared to that of the um, females. And uh, there is also sex-specific uh, territori territoriality. They have uh, strong, they are highly strongly territorial and um, so the males occupy much larger range and then the female occupy much uh, smaller range. Um, uh, if you look at uh, a post occipital scute, we said that, you know, post occipital scute are one of these distinctive features through which we can identify between estuarine crocodile and uh, that of the mugger and uh, other crocodiles. When do they nest? Uh, they nest during, um, uh, it is uh, salt water crocodiles are known to nest during wet season, wet season in the sense during monsoon. Um, but in India, uh, the nesting season slightly, you know, uh, in um, uh, the slightly uh, ahead compared to Australia and other region. Here it starts during uh, peak summers and then, uh, you know, it, it proceeds. Uh, the nest type, uh, we already discussed that this is the only crocodilian that nest um, uh, using a mound like the king cobras. King cobras are also mound nesters. So the saltwater crocodiles are also mound nesters. Where do they nest? They nest in, in the uh, deep forests of uh, mangroves uh, and also near to the river banks. And uh, I'll talk about what kind of nest materials do they use you know, later on. And uh, uh, clutch size uh, it varies between 60 to um, 40 to 60 and sometimes it can also go up to 80 to 90 eggs also. And incubation period, we saw, I saw about you know two two and a half months is the incubation period, and uh, for food and hatch, you know food uh, is almost uh, similar to that of for hatchling, similar to that of mugger. They eat fish, they eat insects, they eat meat, worms, birds, um, you know, um, 
so uh, we spoke about uh, the you know when when do they uh, get uh, sexual maturity and all those things so um, i'll also briefly i would like to touch upon uh, the population estimation methods very briefly um, normally the population estimation is done by uh, something called as the uh, for all the crocodilians uh, it's done for a management purpose because we all know that in early 70s the population went down so drastically for all the crocodilian species and also that of the of the focus species focal species of that of the uh, estuarine crocodiles so so the now that since the rare and release program was uh, initiated and uh, at several places it began began and in fact in in bitterganiga mangroves was the, the main area of prime area for a rare and release program for the saltwater crocodiles and then so the population estimation needs to be conducted every year so that monitoring mechanism exists so that we have a, an idea about the number of individuals of this particular species exist in the wild so the management objective is for conservation largely for conservation and uh, conservation so that you know uh, if it, if there is any declining trend so the population can be recovered there are places where australia and other areas there are harvesting also that happens uh, you know using a sustainable approach uh, and so people when we go for surveying for uh, uh, surveying for crocodile crocodilians to come out with numbers we normally go for to determine where exactly they are distributed in the sense in these areas where exactly they are distributed and in what numbers so we ask uh, where are they distributed how many are there and why are they distributed in that particular area and not in other other areas through this we can also every year if you do this particular uh, population estimation or census so you can actually monitor the change in the numbers and we can ask whether the particular population whether it is increasing or is it decreasing or is it being stable if it is increasing or decreasing it then becomes a management problem so that then you tend to address uh, using your prescriptions so what kind of methods field methods are used field methods is basically um, one is you know you do a day, day count and then you also do a night count day count is normally used for adults and sub adults and juveniles and then the uh, night count is largely used for uh, yearlings because to spot yearlings in the daytime will be very difficult and they will also be found very closer to the uh, river or a stream bank so when you go in the in the night you are using a, a spotlight technique using a torch so and then you count the uh, yearlings and then uh, you can derive the population uh, size and then this is only during this is this is done for the estuarine crocodiles during or for you know or gharial or also for the maga during the peak winter season and also during the new moon uh, period so that you know when you use uh, the spotlight techniques and other things so you you can count and especially for saltwater crocodile when once uh, these uh, the surveys are done one thing one need to keep in mind is these occur in tidal regions tidal regions in the sense there are tidal influences during full moon and new moon time there are high tide it, uh, there are uh, you know the highest of the high tide that happens the water levels are very high so the census operation should happen during uh, the winter season peak winter season and also during the uh, peak low when the, when the when the tidal levels are very low you have to choose those days where so the mud banks are completely exposed so that uh, the, as we discussed these are ectotherms uh, so they allow to you know depend on external temperature so they will have to need a more amount of sunlight for basking so that to regulate their body temperature so the survey is census uh, is done during the um, appropriate time so there are a lot of factors that affect the precision and accuracy of the census operation so what one need to consider during especially censusing for saltwater crocodiles is consider air temperature water temperature sunshine it's very particular wind speed survey time what time you are surveying and and the crucial thing is the tidal and water levels because these are in, um, these are distributed found in uh, the um, in the tidal uh, influenced areas or estuarine or brackish water areas so now what i am going to do in the next couple of slides is uh, 
basically discuss uh, about a couple of work that we carried out very specific to the saltwater uh, crocodiles and how it is very important for their management. Uh, so I'll talk about this one later and I'll first talk about the uh, nesting aspects. So this was a, uh, this was a study that we conducted in, uh, uh, in Bitar Kanika. So when we, when we started the work, we looked at what are the available information on the saltwater crocodiles, the ecological information. Uh, then we realized that there was not much of information available on this particular species. Even when we looked at you know uh, the nesting aspects and other uh, aspects, so we did not have much information, published information. So uh, what information for the last 30, 35 odd years, what information we have generated is some crucial information on the population information of, uh, you know, at which place in, uh, in all this uh, Andaman and Nicobar Island, in Bitar Kanika, in Sundarbans. So we have information on the, uh, and in the population of uh, these, uh, this particular species. And then what we have is information on the conflicts. So normally um, um, the Garial, uh, the Gavialis gangeticus, you know, it does not, um, it's not uh, a conflict creating species, but there are human wildlife conflict uh, be, uh, due to, uh, you know, both the mugger and uh, saltwater crocodiles, the negative interactions that I mean. Uh, so, so, so we did not have much information on other aspects. So we initiated this particular study to look at, you know, where these particular crocodiles are nesting, which are the patches, which are the habitat patches in the mangrove forest they are choosing, and uh, uh, how is their reproductive success, and um, how long do they incubate, and uh, how many how many nests are successful, and all those things. And we also wanted to know whether this particular uh, study can can actually help in the uh, can actually influence the management intervention. So. Uh, so I'll briefly tell about uh, very briefly about this particular study and its findings. So what we found was uh, the uh, the mating or uh, the, the breeding begins during the uh, during the later part of the winters, and then uh, the mating happens in during the winters uh, in the rivers and the streams of uh, this particular area, with Kanika mangroves, and then. Um, Later and then during summers, peak summers, the uh, the the individual, the females uh, come to the nesting site and then they start selecting the uh, nest sites. Once they start selecting the nest sites, then they will start to build the mound nest. And since they have, uh, they will have to collect, uh, they have to collect the leaf materials. They 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 normally uh, collect uh, through their hind limbs, and then they try try to pile up the uh, nest. So the the mound nest. The mound nest is built, and the mound nest is about uh, two meter wide, and it is about seventy to eighty meters of height. And uh, uh, what kind of nest materials is used is uh, basically what we observed was there are two distinct uh, uh, vegetations. One is the Phoenix paludosa, which is also called as the sea date, and then there is another species of fern, mangrove fern, called as the Acrostichum aureum. So these are the only two uh, habitat patches this particular, uh, you know, the saltwater crocodiles prefer to nest. In fact, all of the nest happened only within these two patches. One is the mangrove fern, which is Acrosticum aureum, and then this is the Phoenix paludosa, which is the sea date. In this picture, what you see is the uh, sea date is the Phoenix paludosa patch. And we also wanted to look at whether there is any marked distinct uh, difference in the reproductive success in these two patches. And then what we found was very interesting is the Phoenix paludosa patch had offered more protection to saltwater crocodiles compared to the softer mangrove fern, which is the Acrosticum aureum. One interesting thing is that is because this particular patch of Phoenix paludosa, Phoenix paludosa is also thorny, spiny, and then it also comes along with an another mangrove associate called as the Cecilpenia crista, which is a kind of, a, it, it has a recurved thorn in it. So for any predator, the predator here in, uh, in this place is largely, if you look at the uh, surface predators, these are uh, a wild pig, and then you have a Varanus salvator, the water monitor lizard, uh, those are the, and then there are also aerial predators, but aerial predation, predation is not much higher compared to that of the uh, compared to that of the surface predators. And then uh, we also observed that uh, 
there are uh, you know these these uh, uh, crocodiles they come and you know during april may june and then they start to lay eggs and then uh, uh, till july july august also the nesting happens and then uh, uh, after the nesting uh, season uh, once the clutch is laid clutch is about composed of about as i said about 40 to 60 eggs which can also go up to about 90 eggs if you look at the egg size, it's about uh, eight centimeter by five centimeter long, and it's uh, weighs about roughly about 100 to 120 grams in weight. And uh, what other interesting thing is, you know, um, uh, uh, and then uh, the hatching uh, hatching takes place uh, during the and then the monsoon sets in, and the water levels are and then most of the areas are flooded, and then uh, the uh, the mother crocodile it helps the Hatch, hatchlings to reach into the stream or nearby river and all those things. So two major findings we got from this study. One is the predation level is much higher in a particular patch of Phoenix uh, in Acrosticum aureum patch, and the predation level is much lower in the Phoenix polydosa patch. So now there are also practices of collection of eggs for the you know the uh, rare and release program there are very very few clutches are collected just that you know the practice of rare and release program should go on so that uh, you know in case if there is a population crash god forbid nothing happens like that but you know the technology or technique has to survive so so what we had suggested in this publication is to collect the eggs from uh, acrosticum aureum patches because anyway they are getting going to get predated by because it is a software patch for any predator it has to it can easily come in and we also found that most of the predation happened uh, for the nest which are very closely very which is very closely built very close to the river source river river or a stream or a nala so whenever a nest is built much closer much farther from the water source so the uh, mother crocodile uh, the female crocodile is always there. Uh, the attention, the parental care is much higher for uh, the nest that is built much inland. So these two are very important, very interesting finding that we found and you know we, we have discussed in this particular uh, publication. So this is available online. So you can also, if somebody is interested, can read uh, through this publication. And the second important and interesting, um, you know, the publication that we came out uh, for based on our work is uh, about the conflict levels. So what we did, what we found was, as I said, now you know, this is this Phoenix Polydosa. This is this uh, uh, Phoenix Polydosa patch, which is the nesting. Uh, uh, this is the one of the predominant nesting material for saltwater crocodiles in India, especially in Bitterkanika. And uh, this particular uh, uh, mangrove is also harvested. It used to get harvested for various reasons because it has got uh, termite proof uh, for thatching purpose and also for building fence and all those things. So, so, so there was conflict. Uh, we looked at the conflict data of saltwater crocodiles, and we, what we found was in the last uh, uh, in the last 30, 35 odd years. When we began the conservation work for the saltwater crocodiles in early 70s, so the population was so less that about 96 individuals of saltwater crocodiles was there. When we began this salt the rear end release program and augmented the population. Now, after this augmenting of this population, so so the area of the uh, saltwater crocodile habitat is about 30 30 odd square kilometer. If you look at the Bitterkanika conservation area, the Bitterkanika wildlife sanctuary is about 675 odd square kilometer. And then the mangrove forest is about 145 square kilometer, which is protected. So out of this 145 square kilometer of the mangrove forest, the water body is roughly about only 30 odd square kilometers. So these crocodiles, the, the habitat available is about only 30 odd square kilometers. Now, within this 30 odd square kilometer, the population was 96 in early 1970s when the rear end release program was started. And within the same 30 odd square kilometer, the population has now jumped from 96 to now we had about, we have about 3000 odd individuals. Now, crocodiles being highly territorial animals, so they need very, they need territorial space for each of these individuals. Now imagine 30 odd square kilometers harboring 96 individuals then and 30 odd square kilometer harboring 3000 individuals now. 
Now, so then since there is a lot of space crunch, then the crocodiles have to move to uh, move outside the protected area into the village ponds, and then the conflict happens. And there are some sometimes even there are illegal incursion of people into the protected area. So then there is conflict, and there are mangrove. Uh, there are lo loss of mangrove habitat, and uh, in those places there are grazing that happens, and livestock are killed. So when we looked at the data of how many actually, uh, you know. Uh, human death or human casualties or human injuries or livestock death, livestock, livestock injuries are there. So we, what we found was we found that uh, in the last 30 years there were there have been about 60 to 70 odd uh, human uh, negative interactions with the crocodiles, and which resulted in about 30 odd uh, human deaths, and then uh, uh, about 40 or 40, 40 to 45 uh, um, uh, of uh, injuries. And then uh, similarly about 60 odd uh, you know, livestock uh, attacks. So, but this data is slightly you know older, but now the recent data might be uh, much different. And uh, so what we suggested that is you know at some point of time uh, we need to do some active management. And uh, uh, so uh, there, there, so there is a lot of role for academicians and. Um, uh, you know, academician and conservationist in the sense that we need a lot of more information uh, to be generated, ecological information to be generated on the species. So, so far what we have is only the population numbers, conflict data, some amount of nesting data and nesting ecological information. So what further we need is we need more information on, like for example, in Australia, people have, uh, uh, you know, scientists have uh, fitted uh, satellite transmitters, try to understand their movement ecology, where these particular species is, um, you know, uh, where, where all they can range, uh, you know, where, how much is the home range of a male, how much is the home range of a female, how much is the home range of a juvenile, adult, all these information we do not know, we do not have in Indian context. So now what we need to know is we need to strengthen our uh, or establish more uh, uh, robust information and uh, the population estimation techniques also. What population estimation techniques uh, we use is, you know, also comes with a lot of uh, uh, bias which we need to strengthen and uh, other information on uh, diseases, wildlife health. So all those uh, information needs to be generated. So I think uh, um, with this, I'll uh, complete the uh, talk and uh, I'll leave it to uh, Arundhati and then I'll join back during the question and answer session. Right. Thank you so much, sir, for, you know, encapsulating the whole uh, species biology and, you know, the population estimation techniques in such a brief uh, while. I would, uh, we would now, we will take question answers for this session at the end and we will now move on to the section on the zoo. So joined in today with us to speak on the zoo is Mr. Nikhil uh, Whitaker, who is the curator of the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. He has done his post-graduation in geoinformatics and is currently pursuing his doctorate from the Annamala University. Apart from, being a, uh, apart from being the curator at the Madras Crocodile Bank, he is also an editor to several scientific journals and is a member of the IUCN SSE Crocodile Specialist Group and the Freshwater Turtle and Tortoise Specialist Group. So he will speak to us today more on the zoo. So over to you, sir. I will share the presentation for you. Thank you. Is it visible? Yes. Yes, it is. All right. Okay. Um, good evening. Good evening, uh, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. And um, I also second uh, Dr. Gobi's uh, thanks to the Central Zoo Authority for making this uh, these webinars possible. So I'm here to talk about the Madras Crocodile Bank uh, and our research uh, and education activities, uh, both uh, the ex situ things we do and also the uh, in situ uh, initiatives we have started. OK, next. So actually, the, the uh, the Crocodile Bank was actually started on uh, August 1976, about 45 years ago. And it was just essentially two um, 
manually dredge the aquifers with um, perimeter, perimeter walls around them and um, a couple dozen uh, mulberry or marsh crocodiles, which uh, had been bought in the, or rescued from uh, various, various uh, aquariums and also with the assistance and uh, the collaboration with the Tamil Nadu Forest Department, eggs were collected from the wild in several location, localities and brought back to the bank to, to hatch some of them, which are like three meter long animals, which we have today. Yes. So the first first crocodiles that bred at uh, Croc Bank, of course, were the were the muggers, and uh, these, and on, this was they were pretty closely followed because this was uh, this was is uh, captivity, so it was possible to identify females, uh, individual females and males, and this this resulted in a huge huge voluminous amount of um, research that has come out. Um, including related to, uh, um, as uh, we were talking earlier, um, temperature sex determination, which is uh, a universal thing in all crocodilians, and uh, uh, social hierarchies, uh, husbandry related papers, and so on. And if, after we bred the uh, the mugger, the next, the next species that was bred at the croc bank was the saltwater crocodile, uh, which, if I'm not wrong, is for, bred for the first time in India in uh, 1983. And um, it's a very special thing to get inside an enclosure to, with this saltwater crocodile female to collect her eggs because she really doesn't want you there. And uh, yeah, so it's. That's always exciting. And finally, the third Indian species, um, the Indian gharial, which is uh, critically endangered and is still endangered uh, now, was bred in 1989. We then went on to form our international uh, gene bank, and we're still working on that. We have uh, 15 of the 26 species of uh, crocodiles in the world today. Um, some Notable breedings include the critically endangered Siamese crocodile, and of course, uh, also the um, breeding of the West African dwarf crocodile, uh, spectacle caimans, uh, dwarf crocodiles, more or less crocodiles, and so on. Uh, the, and then we also started it uh, moving out to look into having uh, field stations in areas of high reptile biodiversity. And this is our first one, it's ANET, or the Andaman and Nicobar's environmental team, which is located on South Andaman, and has been instrumental in doing a lot of work on uh, saltwater crocodiles and uh, status surveys in collaboration with the Andamans and Nicobars Forest Department, uh, Wildlife Institute of India, and other agencies. <coughs> well, this is also some of the first uh, sea turtle surveys that were done from here in, in, these, uh, in these islands. It's about 560 different islands, the Andamans. And uh, yes, also on other habitat fauna, such as uh, sea snakes, uh, geckos um, and also looking at um, studying some uh, some of the tribes that have still that still exist in uh, on these islands that was uh, then followed by the um, construction of a field station in the Western Ghats, uh, the Agumbai Rainforest Research Station, which has spearheaded uh, a lot of research into the biology of uh, king cobras, largely thanks to um, the use of radio telemetry. 
And finally, we have the Garial Ecology Project, which is located at Etowa on the Chambal uh, River, where a lot of new information is coming to light about these amazing animals. So, yes, this um, breeding has been ongoing for these uh, three Indian species of crocodilians. And here's yes, here's one of our gharial females, and I believe that's uh, that's a red crown roof turtle nest that we're collecting. And that's the other thing. I mean, of course, it was it is not all the crocodiles. Uh, we started to focus on uh, these um, this taxa, of which we have about thirty two species in India, uh, the Chelonians, which are collectively turtle and tortoises. And uh, yeah, so some of them are um, critically endangered, endangered species, such as the red crown roof turtle. I've been breeding here from 2003, and to date we have sent 26 back for reintroduction. And we also have um, perhaps, I think, the only third, uh, only uh, one of three locations in the world of. Uh, the uh, Northern River Terrapin, uh, Patagro Basca, where we have a breeding group, which has been breeding since we got a male um, to join our two lone females in uh, 2014. We've been breeding them since 2016, and we have discussions with the uh, various range forest departments about reintroduction of this species. Yes. Uh, yes, so this in 1996, the breeding of the uh, king cobra was accomplished. Um, it was a very uh, amazing event. Um, watching this, watching these uh, snakes, which are the only ones in the world, only snakes in the world to actually make a nest. Uh, not even, not even using uh, hands and legs. Of course, they don't have them. So basically using the coils to make this huge mound nest and laying the eggs within there and protecting them for some time. This resulted in about 30 babies, of which we um, we raised to about a sub-adult stage. And, we, uh, and these were given to about a dozen zoos in, in India and, and abroad. Essentially, the idea behind that is that um, when zoos get king cobras from the wild or they're, they're captured from the wild and it's not done so well uh, they use uh, nooses and that kind of thing so the animal is already quite traumatized or if not very very injured and so and uh, raising these uh, uh, king cobras also uh, was done on feeding them rats um, they were scented with uh, snakes and then began to accept the rats so they were able to, we were able to feed them rats rather than snakes. And they were able to, uh, they grew really well. And um, several several of them reached, of the juveniles had reached sub-adult stage and even started to breed by the time we uh, had started to uh, give them away to other zoos. Yeah. And yes, we talked about the red con roof turtles and this is one of the, one of the juveniles in the foreground, um, maybe it's about two years old. We have uh, in the background this uh, small filtration system we have. Uh, the water is uh, pumped out and goes through a gravel bed filtration system and is uh, then pumped back into the enclosure. And on the lower slide, we have two of our males um, basking. Um, and they are um, ex extremely beautiful uh, in, in the breeding season when they develop these white stripes and red red stripes on their faces and uh, as with um, uh, sea turtles females are much much bigger than males and they take a long time to reach maturity maybe maybe 13 to 15 years and they they grow big uh, 30 35 kilograms which is a problem for them because that's that makes them a very uh, i mean they've been seriously hammered by the illegal uh, poaching of this uh, 
by people for the uh, f for flesh and purported medicinal use. So, but we found males to uh, reach maturity as uh, quick as three years over here. But not so with females; it takes a much longer time in this in this species and turtles in general. Yeah. And yes, we really also bred the the Vidika, Vidika Sambo, which is named after the by the legendary snake man of India, Ramalas Vidika. And these are interesting snakes that that they're called sambos, but you actually they're they're quite uh, terrestrial and almost I mean quite uh, arboreal too. I mean they found sometimes several meters high up in uh, coconut palms. Yes. And this is yes, the Garial Conservation Movement, the Garial uh, Conservation, which is, uh, equates to the Garial, Garial Ecology Project. We have a couple dozen of these adults uh, tagged. And uh, we're finding information that indicates that. Uh, from the radio telemetry and uh, the satellite telemetry and sometimes the combination that migrations of a couple of hundred kilometers happen in the, every year in the, uh, on, the, on the Chumbo River um, to feeding grounds and ancestral nesting grounds back and forth. And of course, the Gariel is unique among crop aliens is that it's the only species you can tell males apart from females. And that's a male here. You can see the little gutter, little pot on the uh, end of the snow, and that is absent on females. There's also been some amazing uh, camera trap videos we've seen in the wild of uh, parental care with uh, sometimes, uh, well, unusually with a, a male in crocodiles at least, taking care of hatchlings and forming crushes of 300 to 400 babies. I mean, and he, he'll, he'll look after them, protect them from kites and other predators. Yes. And other milestones were also breeding of the Indian uh, rock python, of which we released, I think, about 12, a dozen, into uh, the Mudavalai Wildlife Sanctuary in Tamil Nadu. And also, in uh, doing an enrichment work with our animals, uh, the reptiles are considered pretty, I mean, uh, stupid, but crocodiles in particular, we farm, like to be trained. I mean, they like to be there. It's a very enriching experience for them and for us too. And to be able to tell the crocodile when to, when to feed and when to, when to go into the water, and they're obeying these commands. It's a very uh, good uh, mental exercise for the animals. And of course, the ongoing breeding of uh, several Indian uh, turtle species that we talked about, um, like the red cone roof turtle, the uh, three stripe turtle, uh, Baragur Dongoka, the uh, Travancore tortoise, which this is the only, the only uh, place in the world that has a breeding population of them. And of course, hopefully soon, we also have our Aldebaran tortoises, which we got from the Czech Republic, reaching maturity. Yeah, yeah so research has always been um, within within the crop bank. It's been it's been an ongoing thing. So it's 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 starts from everything from our. Um, recording about maximum and minimum temperatures and rainfall because these these all affect the behavior in a number of different ways the different seasons and research into um, in the thermal biology of uh, adult mugger crocodiles uh, research into temperature sex determination in the, in the gariel uh, research into um, shedding cycles, the frequency of shedding in, uh, and growth and, um, in king cobras, for example. And we also have community outreach programs 
for example, right now, uh, in fact, focuses on uh, awareness on snake bite in uh, multiple states within the country, and also on the Calvary River um, on mugger crocodiles and how to how to live with them and what not to do around their habitat, basically educating people on that. We also have about 400,000, uh, 400, 450,000 people coming to the park every, uh, every, every year. So there's a lot of uh, public interaction that we do with the education officer and uh, myself and sometimes our volunteers uh, assist with. And we also have uh, herpetology uh, certificate courses. Well, I mean, given this time, because of COVID, and uh, not so much, but uh, yeah, it's been done in the past and more planned for future. Yeah. This is always more potential, so we're looking at updating our uh, Marshall, Marshall plan for the zoo and having a whole different concept of uh, exhibits and educating educational materials and uh, different animals from different different reptiles from different biomes and just to showcase how important they are to the ecosystem and how it's important to keep them how keep them around and uh, so that we can you know, for the generations of people can still appreciate them for what they are And why uh, why go through all this is uh, that it, it creates this education and research. It can it becomes a context for general public, so it's something that they can understand rather than being a very very um, high funder kind of thing. And it provi provides platforms for interested individuals, um, interested uh, universities. Right now, we actually have somebody um, studying uh, stress hormones in uh, mugger crocodiles um, from our mother Bible university. And the resources for conservation are pretty are pretty scarce, so that's that's why I mean, this this does generate resource for, for for example for field equipment and um, payment to uh, staff. And of course, networking is, for conservation is a big thing. Of course, we have a lot of, it, it's not just uh, one organization that does it, of course, it's, it's all, everything, every, I mean, all over the place. With, um, for example, the Wildlife Institute of India, um, National Center for Biological Sciences, uh, Duction, and um, yeah, so many more. And education-wise, uh, we have uh, workshops for adults and uh, children based on reptile themes. It's in the way of uh, quizzes, and, um, games, uh, in the ways of uh, like introducing them to uh, these animals and giving them uh, immersive. Uh, well, that's what we are hoping to do soon. Is to actually have these uh, virtual reality. Um, situations where people can really experience what it's like to be on. Uh, I, I, I did one of them the other, uh, the other the other week with some of the footage from our place and it's, it's incredible. It gives you a whole different context, like you're right with the animal. We also have uh, volunteer opportunities. And, uh, volunteers are given like uh, also help with our public education and uh, also are given a project to choose from to uh, do and learn learn a bit of simple statistics, a little bit of science, and what what makes a reptile a reptile, obviously. Night safaris, of course, are um, it's incredible to uh, be here at night because when you're using the torch and you have a reflection from the crocodile's eyes, it, it's 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 amazing to see a couple of hundred crocodile eyes like reflecting back at you. It's like it's like you're sort of landing. Uh, landing in an airfield and looking at the city below you. 
And we also have uh, school programs and also visits to the schools. And um, this is largely to do with um, the generic environment, um, climate change, um, plastic, plastic cleanup, and yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah, so we also have the uh, behavioral enrichment shows, as we talked about, and this is with our, one of our American alligators and also with our Komodo dragons. The Komodos, it's really important to keep them, to let them, how do you say, remind them that you're uh, um, friends, per se, because they're big lizards and unlike other lizards, when you when you approach them, they don't run away from you. They run towards you. So you you have to stop that. You can't let that happen. So this is done in a way of uh, target training, making them go to a certain place. Once they do that, they get a reward. They're basically a lot more calm. The people are a lot more calm. These huge huge uh, predators are a lot more calm. So enclosure cleaning, enclosure maintenance, blah blah blah. All this is much much easier that way. And yeah, we have uh, zookeeper training. Um, I think we have people from um, Central Zoo in Nepal, and uh, yes, several several other um, not just zoos, but also like um, groups from the Wildlife Trust of India, and um, that's in combination with reptile uh, rescuer guidance best practices. Yeah, so volunteers get to uh, largely assist with, um, the, as we said, public education and uh, feed prepar preparation, largely for the um, about 100, over 150 turtles and tortoises we have over here. It's not an easy task. And uh, also, you can see in this picture is um, showing, uh, acting as guides for visitors, if the if if visitor requests a guide. Um, de monitoring um, development in turtle legs uh, here. You can even see a small embryo inside there. And so they're trained how to do this. Uh, you can actually put the egg up to a light and see uh, how far it's developed based on time. Yeah, so a lot of people have actually volunteered here and uh, gotten, gotten um, uh, have uh, bit, bit the uh, conservation board person has uh, um, And many of them now, are, I mean, in uh, have joined the uh, uh, NOAA and uh, WII and WWF, just to say a few. So for you, and um, of course, we can attend uh, virtual workshops in this time and age. That seems to be the best the best way to go, and we can actually bring the animals to you. So you can follow our social media page on that. And uh, yeah, just spread the word about this uh, place. If you visit here, or if you've seen one of our virtual um, workshops, and uh, seen any of the movies that have been uh, made on species over here which is a couple of them on the king cobra and of course uh please do visit to really see the place it's amazing thank you and that's our male uh northern river turban it's handsome job Good questions Thank you so much, Mr. Nikhil, for giving an overview of the kind of work that's happening at uh, Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. And we now move on to the question and answer session. So we will take questions for the species first. Dr. Gopi, are you there with us? Yes, I am very much there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, sir, the first question for you is that uh, saltwater crocodiles are not yet officially threatened. 
However, mm -hmm. many countries populations have declined uh, significantly. So do you mm -hmm. feel that the rare and release programs should continue? And how do you think that this would impact the current conflict situation? Okay, may, may I please know who, who has asked the question? I think it will be for the audience, it will be better you know this question. Who has asked? Pardon? I think you're, you're unmuted. Sorry, I've not got the name, which has got okay, the it's question. Right. So, it's yeah. Right. It's right. So, yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, Obviously, the population was once threatened and it was decimated so low to very so level, low, low numbers. But now, based because of our good efforts of the government and uh, you know all all those who are involved, now the population is uh, you know doing well. Uh, so it is placed under least concern. It is very good. It's a good good thing. So we'll have to keep our uh, all our species very common. You know, not uh, rare species. And uh, uh, as far as the question is concerned, whether we need to continue the rare and release program, I would say yes, definitely, because the rare and release program is, you know, it requires, it, it, you know, it has been this particular uh, method or technique has evolved over many, many, many years, and it is hard work of many people. So we cannot just stop the rare and release program and they just think that, okay, these uh, populations are all going, doing good. Um, of late, you know, a few years back, we had uh, uh, an example of from Sambal, uh, where there was, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, um, you know, the critically endangered uh, garials died. So what about the, the crux is we need to continue this particular technique of rare and release program. We need to keep this technique alive in case in future if something of some, any crash or anything happens. So we can be uh, rest assured that, the, you know, this can, this can, this technique can come and save us back again. Right, sir. So the second question for you is that uh, do the do the crocodiles do the saltwater crocodiles show breeding site fidelity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, in fact, uh, when I when I spoke about uh, our nesting ecology study in Bitterkanika, one easy thing that we found was uh, we know that there are a lot of uh, nesting happens there. What we did was we just followed up with the known nesting locations and. 100% of the time uh, we uh, get get we got to see a crocodile nest there and the site fidelity is there like crocodiles also sea turtles and uh, you know so similarly they have this site fidelity phenomenon so it is there yeah yes all right, so and the next question for you is that uh, is there any other way to differentiate between males and females apart from size uh, you can you can do sexing also, but um, you cannot do it for hatchlings and yearlings. But yeah, you can do uh, sexing in, in like like nickel could be you know uh, he can shed more light on it. But uh, even in captivity, we do sexing. Uh, uh, yeah, there are techniques available. Yeah. Okay, sir. And so the last question for you is that uh, you mentioned the need for more population status studies and the need for robust techniques of estimation. So in this context, do you think citizen science may may contribute or help to this? Yes, in fact, it can help. But, uh, what I would say, I would say is most of the area where saltwater crocodiles are distributed is are all protected areas. So uh, we need to devise strategies as how. Uh, citizen science in the sense how they can volunteer to take part in during the census operations and uh, yes it can be explored and it, i think it should be explored because for wide variety of taxa now citizen science approach uh, is yielding a lot of good information i think we need to we can uh, use this approach yeah good idea good suggestion Okay, so and one last question is there that uh, since as the mang if mangroves covered, it seems is dwindling in both east and west coast. Coast, what do you suggest? What do you what do you think we should do more to save the you know to safeguard the species in the long in the long term? The mangroves or the saltwater crocodile? <laughs> the habitat, the mangroves habitat. I think okay. they say okay. the mangroves the are mangrove. okay. yes. Okay, for the mangrove habitat, the west coast need not you know all the mangroves are you know. It should be conserved and protected. And uh, uh, the, uh, West Coast and East Coast mangroves are com completely different in, 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 you know, in a way. Uh, the physiography of the mangroves, like for example, the same species which is 40 feet height, uh, like Avicennia marina, is uh, it's li li it's less than six feet height in Western Coast. So there are different reasons to that. But what I would suggest is there are already a lot of uh, programs that is happening. Uh, active programs by governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations about mangrove um, uh, planting techniques, mangrove forestation. And uh, so there are efforts to increase the cover of mangroves, which is underway. 
and uh, as far as salt water crocodile is concerned, uh, concerned it is found only in uh, uh, Sundarbans and uh, Bidarkanika and Andaman Nicobar where mangroves are there and there are also efforts to uh, you know do mangrove uh, there are uh, mangrove plantations that keeps happening and it is being successful also uh, thank you all right sir so those were the questions for you we now move on to questions for mr nikhil so sir the first question for you is that managing large crocodilians like the saltwater crocodile must be a challenge how does the zoo manage uh, the species especially with relation to captive breeding uh, that's that's a good question uh, because well for example we've got i mean our, our largest uh, male is uh, in a is by himself in a is in an enclosure in a pond and to for example if you wanted to start a breeding program for him uh, you'd have to of course put in a female but I think uh, as we uh, we discussed earlier, this this uh, this species is particularly um, pretty intolerant of other individuals, and so if there was conflict between this male and the female, it would it, you would have to be uh, you would have to intervene, and that would um, put risk to both the people and the, and the crocodiles. Of of course, the small female. And the female is scared. She's running around everywhere, and the male is angry. He's running around, so you kind of have to like run around and do that. But yeah, to answer the question, egg collection is yeah always always a good uh, it's it's a good uh, adrenaline rush um, because you have to be very very uh, at least in captivity. We have both the male and the female um, so what a crocodile of a breeding pair defending the nest. There's a lot of pandanas in the area, and then there's really no place to run. So, yeah. All right, sir. And we have one more question for you that your zoo has, is a specialized reptile zoo. So, what is the general reaction of people who visit? And uh, how does how does the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust see the attitudinal change in the visitors? Like, is there any change pre and post? Yes, I mean, actually, people, when they, they first come here, um, initially, they're kind of like, oh, everything is not, this, everything's not alive, or it's all fake. It's like uh, puppets. And then it's, they go further down, and they see some of the demonstration feeding, or the enrichment activities that the keepers are doing, and they're like, okay, all right, so there's something a bit more to this. And then, if they're lucky, then they actually get to see behavior between the animals, for example, territorial chases um, and that kind of thing. And then, yeah, they get completely uh, fascinated. And of course, through our social media uh, stuff, we also um, talk a lot about this, especially with uh, regards to uh, snake bite. And I think people's perceptions after they've uh, visited here and uh, taken their usual on average half an hour 45 minute walk around and uh seen our seen our uh, crocodiles turtles and tortoises snakes and various species of lizards i think it can i think it has it does give a, a different a different they leave with a different sense of appreciation all right, sir. So those were the questions for you. And uh, I think that's it. So with this, we come to an end to our 40th Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. And I would firstly like on behalf of CZA, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Gopi and to Mr. Nikhil for joining, for taking time out of the schedules and joining us for this session. I would also thank the audience for being patient with us throughout and also inform them that the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust will be continuing the outreach activities till the end of the week. So do, do tune into the Instagram and other social media pages to know more on what they have planned and we will be back next week for our 41st know your species know your zoo talk on the ganges soft shell turtle and the kurumba pati uh, zoological park so do tune in for that talk also from 4 to 5 pm on next wednesday that is the 22nd of december and once again thank you so much to the speakers namaskar thank you thank you namaskar.